Okay, so we've got current per unit area is equal to conductivity times electric field. Okay, so let's look at a, um, a wire, for example. So this is a segment of a wire that's connected to a longer circuit. Okay, it has a cross-sectional area A, it has a length L. And inside the wire there's an electric field in some direction. And it's going to cause a current to flow. Conventional current would flow in the same direction. The um, electric field can be calculated, but directly it's often tricky to measure. Okay, It is easier to measure potential differences. And you've done this in lab. You've gotten a voltmeter out, connected your voltmeter to the two ends of a wire, and you get a reading. So you get a voltage. Okay. And the voltage in here, the magnitude of the potential difference across the wire is going to be the electric field times the length. So I can say that the electric field is the potential difference over L. Let me plug that back into here. So I have I over A is equal to sigma times delta V over L. Current, I can also measure the current by Again, pretty easily by just putting an ammeter in, this, in, the, in the circuit, get a reading there. So let me isolate current on one side. And we have sigma times, oops, excuse me, sigma times A over L times delta V. So this is saying that the amount of current I'm going to get is going to be proportional to the potential difference across that wire. And this quantity consists of two things. It consists of material properties, namely the, well, a material property, namely the conductivity, okay, Q times N times U. QN and U are going to be the same no matter how much of the material you have, okay, so that's on a, on a per volume basis, okay. But and then we have the geometry of the actual wire. Okay, how wide it is and how long it is. So all those quantities are combined into something we're going to call resistance. I'm going to say that resistance give the symbol capital R is equal to the length divided by sigma times A. Okay. So in other words, if I make the wire longer, I'm going to get less current given the same potential difference. If I make the wire thicker, if I have a fatter wire, I'm going to get more current given the same potential difference. If I have the same uh, shape of an object but just something with a higher conductivity, I get more current. Okay, So in, we're going to put this in terms of resistance where it's going to be one over this and say that some of this that conventional current then is going to be delta V over R. So in other words, if any of these things changes, if the wire gets longer, if the conductivity increases, uh, excuse me, if the conductivity decreases, or if the area decreases, the resistance goes up. So we have a bigger resistance to the flow of current, right? And again, this is one of these things where it's easier to measure. You can just, if you know the potential difference and you know the current, you can just easily measure this quantity with a couple of meters, okay? Anybody seen this formula before? Yeah, or you may have seen it as delta V is equal to I times R. This is sometimes called what? Ohm's law. Which isn't a particularly great name because it's not really a universal law. It's just describing how uh, current is related to potential difference in conductors, in particular types of materials. Okay. Um, okay, so resistance. It's measured in units of ohms. So the symbol 
The unit of measurement is called an ohm, and the symbol is capital omega, Greek letter omega, hence ohm, okay? Uh, which also means we could write conductivity, by the way, since conductivity has units of amps per volts over meter. Notice that one ohm, if I write this, I R is equal to delta V over I. That's a volt per amp in units. That's one ohm. So one ohm is equal to one volt divided by one amp here. Which means conductivity can be written in units of one over ohms times meters. Okay, so you may see that unit as well. Conductivity. Okay. That's resistance. Uh, let's try a quick calculation here. Okay. A long light bulb is connected to two 1.5 volt batteries and we measure the current to be 0.075 amps. What's the resistance of the long bulb? It should be pretty straightforward. All right, clearly it's gotta be uh, 40 ohms, is that right? Oh, so yeah, because it's two batteries, that's right. So the, to the total potential difference is three volts, that's right. So three volts divided by 0.075 amps, it's gonna give you 40 ohms, okay? So that's resistance, all right? Now, it's, all, it's nice and we often like it when we can we have a resistor, an object, an element in a circuit that has a constant resistance, meaning no matter what potential difference we apply across, we get a current that's uh, obeying this proportionality and so if we have what's called an ohmic resistor or an ohmic element, ohmic behavior, we're plotting the current as a function of the potential difference across the resistor. Okay, you can imagine having sort of a variable power supply or a variable battery and you're cranking the potential difference up. And if the resistance is constant, then the graph should look like what? Should look like a straight line, right? Should look like a straight line where at zero, delta V equals zero, the current is zero, and just goes up as you get a larger potential difference. And the slope of this is what? Not, not R. If I is equal to delta V times, should be one over R, right? One over R. So the slope here is one over R. Okay, so that's an ohmic resistor. But it's very important to know that not everything is ohmic, okay? And in fact, for most materials, what you would find is that there's gonna be some limit to this behavior. If you start cranking up the potential difference too large, provided you don't blow a fuse or anything like that first, you would see something like that, where the slope gets smaller and smaller. So the slope is decreasing and therefore R must be increasing with a higher potential difference. What do you suppose would make the resistance go up when you start getting larger and larger potential differences and therefore larger and larger currents flowing across say a light bulb or a other sort of element. Say again, heat. Okay, so the temperature's going up, right? Temperature's going up. R is equal to L over sigma times A, and we said that uh, the conductivity is Q times N times U times A. You raise the temperature, what's gonna change? Well. It may actually expand the, if you're talking about, say, a filament in a light bulb, if you raise the temperature, it may actually expand a little bit. So the length might change, but not very much. The area is probably not going to change very much. Is the charge actually going to change? The mobile charges? No, that's not going to change. Is the number of available electrons per unit volume going to change? Well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, 
we think that's basically due to quantum mechanical properties, right? We know that metals are giving up one electron per uh, most transition metals, I should say. That it, it may vary, but on on average, it's giving up one or two electrons per atom to the mobile electron C. Uh, in semiconductors, that I actually might actually change. The number of available electrons might actually change in a semiconductor, but in metals, typically that stays constant. It's the mobility that's going to make a difference. The mobility is going to make a difference because what's in our model of a, of conductors, what's happening, what's causing the What's impeding the flow of electrons? Yeah, nuclei. And they are, so electrons come along and collide with, and it's not just the nuclei, but it's sort of the inner core, the nucleus plus the inner electrons. And remember in our simple model, we have this sort of picture of balls and springs connected to each other. And as the temperature goes up, one simple picture is you can imagine if there's a higher temperature, higher thermal energy, these things start vibrating with a higher amplitude. There's going to be a greater likelihood of collisions as the electrons flow through. And so the, the temperature, the, it's the temperature dependence of the mobility in most metals that really is affecting the temperature dependence of the, uh, of the resistance. If the mobility goes down, the resistance is going to go up, and therefore the slope of this thing is going to decrease. So this is what's called non-ohmic behavior. So here's a question. You have long bulb and two batteries, and you get a current of 0.075 amps. Long bulb and one battery, and you get a current of 0.05 amps. Is this ohmic, non-ohmic, or can't tell? Remember that each battery has a voltage of 1.5 volts, AMF of 1.5 volts. Okay, it's going to be non-ohmic because it, it's not scaling linearly. It's not scaling linearly, right? The resistance for one battery is uh, going to be different than the resistance for two. For two, we worked it out to be 40 ohms. For one, it's what, uh, 30? 1.5 divided by 0 0.05 is 30 ohms. Okay. So the resistance is going up with a larger current and therefore a larger temperature, right? Okay, so non-ohmic behavior. Other things, just to keep in mind, that things you may run into in your later careers, other types of non-ohmic objects. Uh, well, a battery for one. Current plotted against voltage for a battery. Well, for an ideal battery, does the voltage depend on the current? No, right? A 9-volt battery is a 9-volt battery whether there's a current flowing across it or not. Now, in non-ideal situations, it actually does change a little bit. We won't talk too much about that, but basically it's like a spike, okay? There's the EMF of the battery, and it doesn't matter what the current is. Uh, semiconductors are kind of interesting. In a semiconductor like silicon or some other sort of material, and it depends on not just the material, but also how it's treated, what it's doped with, what ty types of impurities there are, there are in it. You can have a, a situation where you apply a potential difference, and it behaves like a insulator for a while. There's just no current. And then you reach some sort of threshold, some critical point, where then suddenly you, get a, you start to get a current out of this, okay? And that's a case where what we talked about earlier, the number of available mobile charges actually changes. You reach some sort of critical point where you free up, the electric field becomes large enough to free up mobile charges, and they may be electrons or they may be other things, and we'll talk about that later as well, and can get, and get a, a, a current to flow. So this is another, other examples of non-ohmic behavior. 